Celebrating 45 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, summer officially begins and all this heat on the front burner while historic floods hit Yellowstone. And speaking of heat, the Senate holds a hearing on the continuing western drought. In Southern Gardening, our landscape wizard following the yellow trick mode. And in our feature, as the Supreme Court ponders the case, we take another look at California's Prop 12. Farm Week starts right now. everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us again here on Farm Week. Jonah Holland on set. We continue a new format with the Newswire at the top of the show. Jonah? Thanks, Mike. Once again, lots to talk about today. Let's get right to it. We'll have more on weather and high temps later on in the show. And you may have heard about the recent heat-related deaths of at least 2,000 head of cattle in Kansas. But the FDA said back in late March that meat products from genetically modified cattle bred to be heat resistant don't cause any safety concerns. The process is known as IGA, intentional genomic alteration. And now, with the FDA's blessing, developers can bring their products to market sooner rather than later. In other news, while the Fed raised rates to finesse the demand side of trade, the World Trade Organization met in Geneva to work on the supply side of things. On the table was everything from copyrights for COVID vaccines to ag subsidies. And by week's end, WTO boss Ngozi Okonjo Ivela was confident about subsidies for fisheries as well. Ivela says talks have been productive and is hoping for further agreements. They've been elusive over the last decade. And speaking of trade deals, the U.S. Meat Export Federation is reporting that South Korea has joined Mexico, the Philippines, Taiwan, Vietnam, and Brazil in lowering or eliminating several food trade tariffs. Some of the cuts build on previous agreements already in effect. South Korea's announcement is a duty-free quota on pork expected to be 50,000 metric tons, and it should help many countries, some of which have yet to negotiate free trade agreements. And finally in the Newswire, last week we told you the passage of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act was right around the corner, and that's exactly what happened. Since our broadcast, the president signed the bipartisan bill into law. It expands the regulatory authority of the Federal Maritime Commission and is designed to protect American exporters from unfair trade practices. It is also designed to cut the U.S. trade deficit. And that's it for this week's Newswire. A lot happening. Zach? As Jonah mentioned earlier, 2,000 head of cattle died in Kansas last week due to heat stress. More than a dozen tornadoes touched down in eight states. However, we start our weather wrap with significant flood damage in the nation's oldest national park. Here's Josh Bittner. Floodwaters at their highest level in nearly a century swept through Yellowstone National Park. This cabin on the bank was swept away into the torrent of water and into the Yellowstone River. Roads were washed out, making much of the northern part of the park inaccessible for the remainder of the summer. Much of the region here has been locked in drought for months, even as days of rain and rapid snow melt wrought havoc on southern Montana and northern Wyoming. The look at weekly rain shows continued precipitation in the Upper Plains, extending east towards Ohio. In Iowa, a heavy band of showers flooded fields as some locations experienced five inches of rain in just a short period of time. This area near Ames was inundated midweek. Just hours before, extreme heat hit the same region. Temps nearing the century mark were common with more in the forecast. More than 100 million Americans were under advisement to stay indoors in regions from the Gulf Coast to the Great Lakes and east towards the Carolinas. Drought is still a main concern for the West as conditions have gotten worse. However, the entire continental U.S. had the lowest reading of drought since September, with just over 57 percent of the country in some form of drought. Drought, the continuing focus of producers and everyone they do business with and for. The long southwest monsoon season started a few days ago, but it will take a lot to change the water story and habits of those living under severe drought. Peter Tubbs has more. 
The Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee held a hearing on the growing drought in the western third of the United States. What has been a slow motion train wreck for 20 years is accelerating and the moment of reckoning is near. The two decade old drought has dropped the depth of the nation's two largest water reservoirs, Lake Mead and Lake Powell, to levels unseen since the reservoirs were first filled over 60 years ago. The dwindling flows of the Colorado River are making it more and more difficult to meet the contractual commitments of water service to various cities and states in the region. But in the Colorado River Basin, more conservation and demand management are needed in addition to the actions already underway. Between two and four million acre feet of additional conservation is needed just to protect critical levels in 2023. An acre foot of water is roughly equivalent to the annual water usage of a family of four. Scientists have estimated that the current drought is the worst in the region over the last 1,200 years. Much of the discussion centered around future water usage. Thankfully, we do have options, but we have to manage for the rain and snow patterns that climate scientists tell us we're in for, not for the patterns we long for. As I graze my entire operation in the national forest, it is dead. It is not generating water. The headwaters of the Colorado River is not generating near the numbers of acre feet that it should be because the forest isn't functioning. If basin states cannot reach an agreement, is the department prepared to take actions to impose restrictions on other states without regard to river priority? Yes, we will protect the system but we're not at that decision point yet. The struggle between thirsty crops and thirsty city residents was the crux of some of the testimony. Congress needs to make massive investments in agricultural efficiencies. I agree with Mr. O'Toole that we need to uh, prioritize food security, uh, but we can't balance uh, the structural deficit uh, by evacuating cities. So we're going to need to make our ability to grow the same amount of food with less water uh, a priority. What can you tell me about the Bureau's priorities moving forward as they relate to water levels at Lake Powell? What we're prioritizing right now is really short term. What actions to make up that two to four million acre feet in the basin uh, to help protect Lake Mead and Lake Powell? Because all of the actions that you mentioned uh, the nearly one million acre feet that we did this year buys us a year. And we cannot be in the same place next year where we're talking about critical levels to protect power pool. The National Weather Service expects drought conditions in most of the Southwest to worsen through the summer. On the lighter side, L. Frank Baum, who wrote The Wizard of Oz, once said, the road to the Emerald City is paved with yellow. If that's true, you'll love this story from another wizard, the one of landscapes. Here's Gary Bachman. Yellow flowers are a symbol of friendship in the garden. Let's take a look at some yellow flowering plants brightening the grounds of Sunnyside in Natchez. Who doesn't like the sunny disposition of these yellow daylilies? The beautiful flowers open on arching stems and gently sway in the breeze. Each flower only opens for a single day, with one of the many buds ready to take its place. One of my favorite yellow flowers are Coreopsis. This plant is commonly called tick seed because the seeds resemble ticks. The Heliot Selection offers prolific blooming daisy-like flowers that are splashed with burgundy red at the base of each fringed petal. Uptick yellow and red continuously produces bright yellow flowers with bold red banded petals. I also like the cute teddy bear Coreopsis selection. Prairie coneflower are massed on the back hill creating a meadow-like effect. Each flower has drooping yellow petals and a prominent dark brown cylindrical center disc. This drought tolerant perennial will attract many kinds of pollinators. This can be an aggressive reseeder and the back hill at Sunnyside is the perfect location. Usually we see creeping jenny in containers spilling out over the rim, but it's also great when used as a ground cover. 
I love the effect this chartreuse yellow carpet has as it trails and spreads out into the landscape. Be sure to use any or all of these plants for your own yellow themed landscape. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, Prop 12 in California. It's a major policy shift on livestock, but if it takes effect, it will also impact everyone outside the Golden State. One example, pork producers say it will lead to catastrophic costs. And you know what that means, bringing home the bacon will be a lot tougher. California's Prop 12, the clock is ticking and the Supreme Court will have its say. Coming up on Farm Week, don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership that these are the keys to democracy, and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest, but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report. Things keep getting more and more interesting as we move forward. That's right, Mike. You know, <laughs> the crop prices keep seesawing back and forth. It really makes you long for those days of one to two cent price changes. Absolutely. We'll be talking about that and more. But first, the numbers still moving in dramatic directions. Then our row report speculating on wheat prices. And finally, the ever present inflation story. Is it here to stay? We'll talk about it. Market split again last week, row crops mostly down, while livestock slightly up. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, soybeans down 43.5 cents, followed by wheat at 36.5. We'll get into why in just a bit. Last week's biggest gain, lumber, back up nearly 30 bucks, and corn up 11 and a quarter cents. Much of that having to do with price correction based on weather and supply. So this week in our row report, we're focusing on wheat. You know, it's one of the biggest stories since the start of the Ukraine war. But wait just a minute. Market analyst Ted Seifried says the price is justified, but inflated due to the war. Uh, we were quite heavy on Friday. So the question is, you know, harvest pressure. When are we going to be done with that? I would, I would think that in a year like this where uh, this crop's a lot smaller than what we were thinking, what we were intending to have, right? So when that happens, you've got a fair amount of wheat that's already been sold, uh, so it doesn't have to go. When it comes to town, it doesn't have to, the cash doesn't have to go to market. Um, and whatever you are doing, whatever is getting sold, uh, it's probably going to dry up sooner than it usually does. So I'm thinking by the time we're 40 to 50, maybe 45 percent harvested, that harvest pressure should probably be done. In a normal year, you say 60 to 70 percent harvested. That's when the harvest pressure lifts and we start to get that post-harvest rally. Uh, this year, I think that happens earlier, so it might be within the next week or so. Um, but again, that kind of depends on what's going on with row crops, I think, and it also kind of depends on what's going on with the whole macroeconomic 
uh, climate that we have as well. You know, we found a, a level um, that really, I think we've, we're sort of value priced in wheat and without seeing a huge increase in exports, it's tough to say that, you know, the initial spike that we got from the Ukraine or the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's hard to say that was really justified. In fact, at the time, it was a short squeeze. It wasn't really fundamentally justified, in my opinion. Now, since then, we've had some bullish things happen for the wheat. Obviously, drought, obviously low yields, you know, production issues, not only here, but in other places as well, that have kind of come in to justify some of these higher prices. But whether we go higher or not, I think really hinges on, hey, are we going to see this influx of business coming in uh, to see, for our wheat export program? And we haven't seen that so yeah. far. Uh, I think you have to have really big doubts about that. So, yeah, uh, again, I think wheat can recover after we get past the harvest pressure. I think there can be some more upside, but it has to come from strength in the row crops. I think at this point, wheat would be the follower. Inflation, that's the big economic news we're all talking about. But is it here to stay? Once again, Ted Seifert says we are in an inflationary bubble, and it could burst sooner rather than later. Input costs are starting to come down, as sort of predicted. And, you know, if you're a believer that we're going to see uh, an inflationary bubble burst happen between now and next growing season, that would suggest that we're going to be paying quite a bit lower for input costs. It would also suggest that corn prices could be quite a bit lower by that time, too. Um, I want to be careful because I do realize that there is fairly significant upside potential in the short term based on weather forecasts, based on a blow off top in the inflationary climate of the market. Uh, but I really worry about where we're going to be, even going into, into this harvest, and then for the next following couple of years. I really thought this was going to stick around for quite a while, and it has. But now you see the cracks coming in the foundation in the form of what's happening with the stock market, what's happening with cryptocurrency. A lot of the wealth and money flow in the economy that's created this inflation has kind of disappeared, gone away because of the wealth destruction that's happened in other markets. And we have to take notice of that. We, we have to realize that over time, that along with higher interest rates will really go a very long way to not only busting this inflationary bubble, but really taking us to a period of deflation possibly. You know, commodities are, are directly in, impacted by inflation because that's the thing. You know, when there's more money in the money supply, then the money is worth less and commodities have to be worth more. That's really the definition of inflation. Um, but the thing is, when you're taking money out of that money supply, that leaves that inflationary bubble at risk for bursting. When it does, what happens is the products that you use these commodities to make, i.e. beef, i.e. ethanol, you know, things like that. In an inflationary climate, it's okay to have high-priced inputs because the products are high-priced and people are willing to absorb that. But when you have that inflationary bubble burst and people are not willing to absorb those higher prices and pay those higher prices for the products, that demand starts to, that, that's what we call demand destruction. Demand starts to go away. Then the inputs have a problem because they can't be high priced if the products that they're making, if that demand's going away. So the demand for the inputs goes away, i.e. corn, right? So, um, yeah, it, it, inflation goes away. That's a big problem for grains. I'm going to argue there's probably about a dollar to two dollars of of value in corn, of the price in corn, that is 100% tied into inflation. And if you take the inflation away, and you're still, even if you're still looking at the same balance sheet or possibly even slightly more bullish, I still think there's a rare, very sizable downdraft that can happen in corn prices uh, just because of inflation. Go back to 2007, 8, and 9, and you'll see what I'm talking about. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Mike? Thank you, Zach. Our feature this week, an encore look at a major policy shift in California now under review by the Supreme Court. It's known as Prop 12 about how livestock must be housed, and it comes from the state with the number one ag economy by far in the nation. The kicker, though, is that it will force compliance on other states, and that's the issue. Colleen Bradford Krantz has the story. Terry Walters expects the sow buildings in which he has partial ownership will have to be reconfigured to allow more space for each animal if a California statute known as Proposition 12 is implemented in six months. The Pipestone, Minnesota farmer doesn't think it will matter that he's not a resident of California. These regulations uh, set a precedent that a state now is going to mandate how we have to produce that product. And so if one state 
has one regulation and one state has another regulation, I only have one pig. I can't make my pig meet everybody's regulation. As of January 1st, 2022, the rules for food products sold in California require all egg-laying hens to be raised in a large pen setting with at least one square foot per bird. All calves raised for veal must be provided at least 43 square feet, and all sows must be raised in an area that is a minimum of 24 square feet. While the egg industry had already adjusted somewhat due to an earlier California statute, the impact would be newer to the hog industry and would require most typical sow stalls to be enlarged by about a third over the current average of 18 square feet. Packers will face the choice of either losing the significant California market, which consumes an estimated 15 percent of the nation's pork, or only buying from producers who comply. One study suggests that less than 4 percent of the nation's sow housing would be currently considered compliant. The National Pork Producers Council sent a letter to Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack last week asking for his help. It argued that California's Proposition 12 will lead to catastrophic costs for the nation's pork producers. California officials say the rule, first proposed by the Humane Society and approved by the state's voters in 2018 with 63 percent in favor, is simply the expression of their citizens' wishes. It is a law that passed by very popular vote, and our job is to implement it and ensure the integrity of the program that goes forward. Several national meat industry groups convinced the California law will affect farmers nationwide have been pursuing legal challenges to Proposition 12. They argue the statute violates the doctrine known as the Commerce Clause, which prohibits state legislation discriminating against interstate or international commerce. In an April appeals hearing in California federal court, lawyers for the National Pork Producers Council and California state government explained their respective stances. Uh, Proposition 12 controls only the sale of pork products in California. And so it is analogous to, to Walsh. And we, you know, that's the common thread. That states have always been permitted to exercise their sovereign power uh, over sales within the state. The result of that is that those immense costs, $3 million for just one of our declarants to conform to that, are going to be borne by every single market hog borne by that sale. They're going to be sold in Illinois and in Michigan and lots of other states where the consumers do not want to pay for California's preferences for sow housing. At least one agricultural policy expert is doubtful these challenges will succeed as a similar attempt failed when California passed Proposition 2 in 2008. That earlier statute, effective in 2015, required owners of California's egg-laying poultry, sows and calves raised for veal, to provide enough room for each animal to fully turn around and extend their limbs. It initially applied only to those animals raised in California, but when the state's legislature realized they were putting their own egg producers at a disadvantage, the statute was expanded to all eggs sold in the state. In response to Prop 2, um, some, some uh, attorneys general from, from some of the kind of big egg producing states tried the same thing to get the, the uh, Supreme Court to strike down Prop 2, uh, and the Supreme Court declined to do that. The reason kind of on their face that they said they wouldn't do it is because the attorneys general basically weren't egg farmers, uh, and so they didn't have kind of a right to criticize this law. I think in reality, that's sort of just trying to dodge the issue. Michigan State's Schaefer helped conduct a study that showed the older statute, Proposition 2, did increase egg costs across the country. The increased prices, he concluded, would hit the nation's lower income consumers the hardest. The fallout from the measure also increased the speed of consolidation as some poultry farmers left the business rather than spend the money to rebuild their laying facilities. Schaefer expects Proposition 12 will do the same thing to the hog industry. He would prefer to see livestock housing changes come from economic pressure that starts in the grocery store 
rather than being directed by a single state's popular vote. If we care about animal welfare, I might be willing to pay more for um, animal welfare friendly eggs or animal welfare friendly uh, pork. Um, this is a different thing, right? Those people that said no now don't get the option um, to vote with their wallets anymore. And so uh, that is definitely going to negatively infect and, uh, and, and has negatively affected sort of the poor people who um, rely on kind of these staple proteins to feed their families. California Agriculture Secretary Ross would have preferred a legislative debate. Our proposition process, uh, you know, just really restricts that exchange of information and the kind of sometimes very detailed and precise scientific information that's hard to convey when it ends up being in a campaign that's about, you know, 30 second sound bites. No question there will be even larger opposition to Prop 12 if and when it takes effect. Well, next time on the show, as we conclude our 45th season on the air, a trip back in time, simpler times for simple pleasures. We'll bring you a Farm Week feature first produced more than 20 years ago, and you'll meet Mr. George Berry, a woodcarver extraordinaire. Mr. Berry is gone now, but back then his carvings brought joy to the hearts of many, and he did it all the old fashioned way with a pocket knife. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. See you next week. Thanks for watching.